If you could go back in time to witness any one single event in the history of humankind, what would that moment be? Well, this week I googled that question and came across some random top five list from some person, and here are the top events that this random person thought were the top five events. Number one on the list, man landing on the moon. It's a pretty good one. That's, that's pretty good. The Wright brothers taking off, watching Leonardo da Vinci paint the Mona Lisa. I'm gonna have to quibble with that one. Not, not, I mean, it's gonna, that's gonna take a long time. You know, I kind of know what that's going to end up. I don't know about that one. The birth of Jesus. There we go. Top five moment. Good to see there. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. That is this person's top five list. For me, there was a Wilco concert in 1995 at Howlin' Wolf in New Orleans. Would love to go back to that event. Uh, or more practically, last Tuesday when I lost the uh, lens cap to my camera. So there's that. Um, on the list that we heard, it's great to see that uh, our guy Jesus made the top five, but I think we can add a few more Jesus moments. These are my top five moments. I was talking about this with my son this week while we were at the beach. Um, here are top five moments with Jesus. Number one on the list for me is the resurrection. Right? I mean, just to be there right off to the side to see the stone roll away, it doesn't get, not so much with the crucifixion, but the resurrection, pretty good stuff there. Jesus visiting the temple for the first time, that's a good one. Feeding of the 5,000. Jesus walking on water, and even Peter walking on water. And the Last Supper, that's a pretty good list. But what about the text from this morning? Would that make your top five? The road to Emmaus, and then here we are in this room where Jesus reveals himself. Might not sound fun on a surface level. That was probably a long walk uh, in some uncomfortable shoes, probably no shoes. Um, but did you catch how the greatest Sunday school lesson in the history of Sunday school lessons was given by Jesus? Clevis never wrote it down, so, I mean, that's terrible. Um, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Imagine eavesdropping on that conversation. And then later, Jesus suddenly appears, showing off his wounds and then asking for something to eat. I've always wondered about the poor person who made the fish that night, you know? I mean, you've got, you know, Martha's recipe from down in Sea of Galilee, but did, did they know they were making fish for Jesus? Probably would have put a little bit more care into it. Um, this entire post-resurrection story has been studied and studied by historians and theologians since the moment it happened. This morning, this morning it is anchoring and concluding a message on a sermon series that you have been studying this summer on creativity. And there is something that happens in this story that unleashes the creative work of the Holy Spirit. That something is the focus this morning, and it's the key to unlocking, in my opinion, all of creativity. And I would venture to say it's the key to life itself, and certainly a life with Christ, and that something is vulnerability. Vulnerability, being open, taking a healthy risk, leaning in to those uncomfortable moments in our life. Maybe sharing something with someone you trust, reaching out to someone who you haven't talked to in a very long time to say, I am sorry sharing with someone that they've done something that upset you, and then you share why that something hurt you. Waking up in the morning and choosing to wear a bow tie that looks like the colors of the University of Florida, just steps away from LSU, vulnerability. That seventh grade play moment, 
You've practiced, you've memorized the lines, you've memorized the dance moves, but you're about to sing and dance in front of a hundred people, and they might not like it. Your palms are sweating, your heart is beating through your shirt, and you just want to bolt out of that seventh grade gymnasium because you are about to be vulnerable. There's a lot of vulnerability in today's text. There's vulnerability in walking down a road with a complete stranger. There's vulnerability in inviting that stranger to dinner. And there's vulnerability showing off your wounds, which is what Jesus did. Did you notice that part? Jesus showed them his wounds in a deeply vulnerable moment. It's always struck me as a bit odd that the wounds of Jesus carried forward. I mean, it's Jesus. He couldn't get one of those flesh-covered Band-Aids to cover that up. But they carried forward. Now, of course, these wounds were playing a critical role in identification for the disciples at that moment, in identifying Mark, if you will, but the, to, to the disciples, to those who knew him best, the wound said so much more, so much more. The wounds were deeply personal, and they spoke to them in a way words simply could not. Not only was it vulnerable to show off wounds, but it was vulnerable at that time to show wounds of a human body to anyone. Jesus wasn't hiding or masking or band-aiding. He was modeling vulnerability. It wasn't the first time, nor would it be the last time that Jesus would model vulnerability. Now this word vulnerable, the root word of vulnerability, comes from the Latin vulnere, which means in some ways to wound, to expose a wound or to wound. And maybe that's why we have a negative connotation with the word vulnerability. No one likes being wounded. No one likes to wound another person. But if we realize that we as humans are already wounded, then we also have an opportunity to heal because we are vulnerable. Vulnerability is thus the first step in healing, and it's the first step in creating. Some of our best creative work comes from embracing, not hiding, our vulnerabilities. Take, for instance, the work of Charles Schultz. You know Charles Schultz, the writer of the Peanuts cartoon, Lucy, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, we all know Peanuts. Schultz once characterized Peanuts as a study in his own dealings with disappointment, depression, and anxiety. He said this, all the loves in the cartoon strip are failures. All the baseball games are lost. The test scores are D minuses. The great pumpkin never comes, and the football is always pulled away. And we can't imagine Peanuts any other way because Schultz is embracing his vulnerabilities for the sake of creativity. In fact, vulnerability is the act of creating. All creative works begin and end with vulnerability. Think about the most basic of the creative processes. Last week, we were painting in the sanctuary. There is vulnerability in even the act of painting that you're going to take a brush and approach the canvas and begin to paint. What color are you gonna choose? Is it gonna be oil? Is it gonna be watercolors? Is it gonna be regular paint? There is vulnerability in creating that first brush stroke on a canvas. And on the opposite end, when the art is finished, it is shown to yourself or to your friends, your family, to the world, there is vulnerability in showing off your artwork and saying, hey, look at what I just painted. 
take a look at this. There's vulnerability there. And you wait with great anticipation for the reaction. The most dreaded reaction, of course, is, oh, that's interesting. Interesting, code for, I don't really get it, so I'm, I'm just gonna say interesting. We don't like being criticized, do we? In fact, that process of sharing and opening ourselves up for criticism and judgment about something we've created, it is why so many of us do not create. It falls under the category of uncertainty and more specifically, the fear of uncertainty. We as human beings are riddled with a fear of failing, making mistakes, of not meeting people's expectations, and the worst, being criticized. This fear prevents us from producing work in our most creative form. Think about it. The most creative form that we have ever been in our entire lives is when we were kids. When we were kids. Finger painting, Lego building, forts made out of cardboard boxes, no fear of people's expectations, and we certainly didn't mind criticism because when you're three years old and someone criticizes you, you can't understand anything they're saying to begin with. Picasso said it so plainly, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. Instead, as adults, we begin to fear the thing that we are called on to create. Silvio Cremar is a landscape photographer, and he writes about the creative process being the vulnerability being the key to the creative process. He wrote this, the work we most fear is the kind of work we most need to create. Let me repeat that. The work we most fear is the kind of work we most need to create. It is this work that will satisfy us the most and that will more powerfully connect to an audience. Accepting failure and imperfection liberates us and opens doors to new modes of experimentation. He says vulnerability is essential for creativity and if we learn to embrace it, the benefits will extend way beyond our art. And I agree. I believe it can extend way beyond art. I believe that because I believe that God is vulnerability in its most perfect form. Jesus' ministry on earth is the greatest act of creation ever, and it was bookended with vulnerability. Look at the beginning of the Jesus art, the Jesus play, the Jesus story. It is vulnerability. The art begins with Jesus, God, arriving on earth as a vulnerable infant in a cattle trough. In the margins of society, born in an obscure village, growing up in another obscure village, and never traveling more than 200 miles away from where he grew up. Vulnerability. The art ends with his friends running away, turning him over to his enemies, the mockery of a trial, forced to carry his own cross, tortured, stripped naked, hanging in the middle of town, and when he was dead, they buried him in a borrowed grave. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. For all of the glory we give to Christ, the power that we associate with Christ, and the kingdom that we subscribe to with Christ, none of it was or is or ever will be possible without vulnerability. And for us to say we are disciples of Christ, that we too must subscribe and associate with vulnerability. For it is through the vulnerability that we grow. It is through vulnerability that we grow, not through resistance, not through certainty, not through having all of the answers in life, not through fortitude or even strength, 
It is, my friends, vulnerability that is the kingdom of God. Our vulnerability in the creative process is the best path to finding a higher sense of calling. And our vulnerability is the best path to finding a clearer picture of who God is and how God is working in our lives. So, guest preacher man, what does vulnerability look like in our spiritual lives? A good question. Dr. Mark Baker is the author of Jesus, the greatest therapist who ever lived, and he wrote this. Jesus taught a lot about love and joy, but he never taught his followers to avoid pain. To Jesus, vulnerability was certainly not a weakness, but was actually a sign of spiritual strength. Now, being vulnerable requires a safe space. It requires trust. I have news for you. If you leave here today and go to Walmart and try to be vulnerable with the guy in the produce aisle, it's going to be a little awkward. But that's why we have small groups. It's why we have Christian community. This church, like so many others, consistently strives for ways to foster genuine relationships with one another. Genuine relationships that dig us to continually go deeper and deeper and deeper. That lead to vulnerability and healing. Friends, it is with others that we realize that all of this garbage that we are carrying, not only is it heavy, not only is it burdensome, but could it be, could it be that this is for someone else? Could it be that your garbage is the garbage that someone else needs to hear about on their own road to Emmaus? I remember years ago going to a men's retreat, and at the time in my life, just going to a men's retreat was vulnerable. And I remember sitting in some conference room, and the leader of the men's retreat handed out oranges to everyone. And so we've got this orange. We're waiting for direction on what to do with the orange. And I remember the leader of this retreat asking us, what is the heart of this orange? What is it that gives this orange its life? What is the most important part of this orange? And the answer, of course, is the seed. The seed that was so protected by the fruit and the outer covering. And he said, we've got to get to the seed. So get to it. And so there we are in this conference room, peeling away an orange, got all these orange peelings, didn't know what to do with them, dropping on the floor, there's no trash can. Next thing you know, we're holding fruit, and the fruit is dripping on my hand and my arm, and it's wet, and it's sticky, and I'm like, what am I doing? Get deeper, Todd, get deeper. And that was the whole point. Getting to the heart of the matter is messy. It is sticky. It is uncomfortable. But it requires all of us to go deeper. And throughout that men's retreat, the constant refrain was, go deeper. Lean into your vulnerability. And sure enough, as we got deeper, on all the issues in our lives, there were others who said, I too am struggling with that, and here is how Jesus helped me. Vulnerability got us there. Jesus, after that long walk, showed his wounds. He showed his wounds because he knew that the surface level was not deep enough. He had to be vulnerable. 
Reverend Mike Angel is an Episcopal priest in St. Louis, and he wrote this. Wonderful words. Listen to these words. In our society, we are motivated to hide our wounds, to cover up our imperfections. But Jesus offers another way. Jesus offers ostentatious vulnerability. Jesus offers healing. Our imperfections, our sorrow, our pain simply do not belong to us. We are not made to hide away and lick our wounds. We are made for community. We are made for vulnerability, he writes. We are made for love. We can only truly encounter one another when we are able to say, I too have suffered. We are only able to love one another's imperfections when we have given up on our own quest for perfectionism. We are only able to know God's love when we accept that God loves our whole story, our whole self, even those parts we wish we could hide away. By his wounds we are healed. But in order for all of us to get there, in order for all of us to get there to a place of vulnerability, both in our creative life and in our life with Christ, we need to give God our all. We need to do the messy work and get to the heart of the matter. We need to give God the entire bag because there once was a farmer. He had just returned from the field with a bag of wheat for his family. He was proud of the harvest as it would feed his family for months and he was happy. Along came the king. The king also had a bag. It was a bag full of gold coins because the king always has a bag of gold coins. The king sees the farmer and sees the wheat and says, give me some of your wheat. And the farmer thinks to himself, you know, I just, I just harvested all this wheat. Like, what is this guy doing? What am I gonna do? And just then the farmer thinks to himself, I must give the king some of my wheat and he reaches into his bag and he pulls out a single grain of wheat and gives it to the king. The king then digs into his bag and pulls out one single gold coin and gives it to the farmer. As the farmer walked away, he couldn't help but think to himself, what if I had given the king the entire bag. Friends, God is asking each and every one of us each and every day to give God the entire bag. With vulnerable and open hearts. For it is when we do this that the harvest be so plentiful